Human history deals with conflict. People tend not to agree. Yet to accomplish almost anything worthwhile, people need to all pull in the same direction. Getting people to do tomorrow what they were able to do yesterday, we call management. Getting people to agree to do something different tomorrow from what they did in the past, we call leadership. An important reason to study history lies in understanding what it takes to get people to accept and work to make a change. I'm Tom Army, and this is United States History Online. 39 men met in Philadelphia between May and September 1787 and wrote and signed the framework for a new Republican form of government. We call that document the United States Constitution. But at the time, these 39 men, called the Founding Fathers, had only written a proposal for us to have a country under a unified government at least nine of the 13 states had to agree or ratify that proposal to make it into our Constitution. The Founding Fathers had suggested that each state elect a ratifying convention, and that was written in the transmittal page of the proposed Constitution, otherwise known as the fifth page. Every state, except Rhode Island, followed that suggestion. People don't always agree, remember? Surprisingly, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Georgia, and Connecticut all voted overwhelmingly to accept the new Constitution in rapid succession. Perhaps people can agree. But hold on a minute. In Massachusetts, the proposed Constitution ran into serious organized opposition. As debate opened at the Long Lane Meeting House, delegates called for a free conversation. They vowed not to vote, quote, until every member shall have had opportunity fully to express his sentiments, unquote. Paragraph by paragraph, the Federalists, the delegates who supported the new government, extolled the Constitution's benefits and with great oratorical skill answered the vehement concerns many other delegates had about the proposed Constitution. Rufus King and Dummer Sewall argued that the powers granted to Congress would be used by the people's representatives only to promote the people's welfare. Jonathan Smith, a farmer from Berkshire County, spoke at length at how the Shayites, the sympathizers from Shays' Rebellion of 1786 and 1787, had spread anarchy and discord the previous winter, and only the establishment of a new government would serve as a cure for these disorders. Those opposed to the Constitution were called anti-federalists, and all were fearful that establishing a strong national government with the power to tax and control the military represented a threat to liberty and freedom, just as the British Parliament and King had done. Samuel Thompson and Thaniel Bishop led the anti-federalist campaign to reject the proposed Constitution. They recoiled at the notion of a six-year term for senators, abhorred the idea of Congress's power to collect taxes, and wanted the Constitution to specifically prohibit Congress from inventing cruel and unheard of punishments. Why was there no time limit in the proposed Constitution on the suspension of habeas corpus? Why did it lack a Bill of Rights? 
Several men suggested adding amendments to the Constitution, but the Federalists insisted that the representatives must vote up or down on the proposal as is. Had the vote been taken in late January, Massachusetts would have voted down the proposed new Constitution. Furthermore, states like Maryland, New York, and Virginia that had not yet held their conventions might have decided to forego their conventions entirely if Massachusetts had voted no. What happened in Massachusetts that saved our country at that fragile moment? What would it take to allow people to set aside their differences and try something new? What would you have done if you were attending this contentious, seemingly deadlocked meeting? Convention President John Hancock called for a committee of 25 delegates to discuss amendments. Dr. Charles Jarvis from Boston, a delegate who doubted the wisdom of this proposed new constitution, said the convention derived its authority not from the late federal convention or Congress or the state legislature, but from the people who authorized the delegates to execute the most important trust which it is possible to receive. Therefore, if the delegates decided to draft amendments, they had the authority to do so. That was exactly what the Committee of 25 did, and they then reported back to the full convention. The Federalists, seeing the possibility of compromise, reminded everyone that ratification was unconditional. But they promised to do all in their power to see to it that if the new Constitution should go into effect, they would work tirelessly to adopt appropriate amendments to the Constitution. For delegates like Nathaniel Burrell, the Federalist promise of amendments was enough to switch his vote from nay to yay. A few others followed Burrell's lead, and at 4 o'clock on February 5, 1788, the convention voted 187 delegates for and 168 against. Massachusetts had ratified the new Constitution. A Boston newspaper, the Independent Chronicle, commented on the manly and honorable conduct of those who voted against the Constitution. One of the opposition leaders, William Widgery, said he had been overruled by a majority of wise and understanding men, and he would try to sow the seeds of union and peace among the people he represented. John Taylor said he was fairly beaten and he would try to infuse a spirit of harmony and love among the people when he returned home. Historian Pauline Mayer, author of Ratification, The People Debate the Constitution, 1787 to 1788, argued the difference in the outcome was due to Massachusetts Federalists who, quote, listened to delegates with objections to the Constitution, addressed their concerns, and answered their questions with seriousness, and in general, treated them publicly with the respect their power demanded. Even if they were uneducated, and had no wealth to speak of, and had supported Shays' rebellion." Unquote. Subsequently, conventions in all but Maryland recommended amendments as part of their decision to ratify. The lists of recommended amendments and the Federalist promise to work for amendments set in motion the process by which the first ten amendments, or the Bill of Rights, were added to the Constitution in 1791. In turn, the actions of the first Congress to propose amendments induced the holdout states of North Carolina and Rhode Island to elect conventions 
and ratify the Constitution. The United States would not have come about if our early leaders had not understood that leadership requires listening and validating the spectrum of viewpoints humans bring to every issue. Fortunately, humans do seem to have the capacity to compromise and pull together for the greater good when they feel heard and respected.